thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I would like to welcome you officially to the second chapter from our Who's Left Behind series. So this is a programme of events that we've been doing here at Open Eye Gallery, focusing on the voice of the social care sector and working with um, older adults in the wake of the global pandemic. So I'm Liz Viviora, um, I'm the Head of Social Practice at Open Eye Gallery. Some of you are recognised um, are familiar faces, some of you are new, so um, welcome everybody. Um, and I'm going to be your host for today. So I just wanted to give you some kind of housekeeping rules for today's event, if that's all right, just before we start. Um, so as we're going to have a number of different speakers taking part, um, we've suggested that we request that if people could take, put their microphones on mute, just for this first half, just while the speakers are presenting, um, and then we'd love to welcome you to kind of turn your mics back on as and when you'd like to say something or ask a question just after that initial presentation bit's done, if that's all right. Um, also, just to say that we've got um, a real mix and diverse range of people with us today. Some who might be really comfortable using Zoom and other, others who maybe don't use it as much. So if we could please just ask everyone to be respectful and patient to ensure that everybody has the time to contribute in, in, a, in a pace and a way that works for them, that would be great. Um, now the event's super in, un, um, informal. Um, so we're really looking forward to honest and positive discussions throughout. Um, and just to also flag, we are recording today's session with the view that we'll put the recording up on YouTube so that more people that couldn't come along today can still see the event afterwards. So if for any reason you're not comfortable um, with being recorded, then feel free to turn your cameras off at any stage. That's totally fine. Um, if needs be, we can edit this bit out if your camera's on and you want them off. So don't worry about that. Um, so with that, um, that's all the kind of formal bit out of the way. Um, I'd love to now introduce our guest speakers. Um, and I'd actually just quite like them to introduce themselves. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to uh, photographer Ty Devlin to do that first, and then I'll just call out our speakers' names, and then we'll hand back over to Ty, who's going to do a bit of a presentation about the two projects that kind of works in progress that we're looking at today. Uh, so go on, Ty, I've, I've picked on you first. Okay, so. yeah. Hi, uh, I'm, my name's Ty Devlin, I'm originally from Ireland, now based in Liverpool. Um, I'm also a photography tutor at Hubert College. Um, and I've been working on two different projects, one with community integrated care um, and looking and working with people who are working in social care and exploring their experiences during lockdown. Uh, the other is work with the Surf Dementia Group in Liverpool. Um, so I suppose we've just sort of started on that um, and almost finished up the other work with community integrated care. So I'll be talking about those in a little bit. Thanks, Ty. Um, and then Sarah? Ruby? Hi, really nice to see everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Butchard. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist working in Mercy Care, um, which is Mental Health Trust in Liverpool. Um, I also work at University of Liverpool and I'm quite involved with Lots, a few people here who are living with dementia or supporting people living with dementia and so I've been involved in projects with Liz and Tig for the last few years really so I'm um, really delighted to be able to come along and share some of the work that we've done and, and hopefully support some of the other people here who are living with dementia to share their thoughts as well so great to be with you. Thanks Sarah. And then Roy? Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Roy, you know, and I live independently with a form of dementia, a newer body dementia, Parkinson's disease, uh, patients of, uh, of Mercy Care, and uh, Broadway in Hospital. Very interested in how you can use photography as a means or a tool. We're supposed to enhance the understanding about living with dementia. We've done work in the past, myself and others living with dementia and carers with open eye on the tape That's about it, I think. Great, thank you, Roy. And then Mark. Thank you, Liz, and hi, everybody. Um, uh, you know, I'm Mark Adams, Chief Executive of Community Integrated Care. 
Uh, we're one of the largest uh, supported living charities in the UK uh, with a team of about five and a half thousand care workers supporting about three and a half thousand people around the UK uh, to live independently. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Countess of Chester Hospital. Uh, very delighted uh, to be involved with this project and excited to see what Tiger's going to share with us. Great, thank you. Um, so I think that's all the people that I, I roped into being speakers, but um, I think we're quite a nice number today. So, so hopefully we'll hear from everybody at some point. Um, and do please introduce yourselves as and, as and when we get to that stage. Um, but if it's okay, I'm going to hand back over to Ty now. I think it's going to show yep. us a bit. Okay, so I just want to share this screen. Just give me one second. Um, Sorry, just trying to get the right. Um, so hopefully this will appear. So can you see that image? Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah, this is um. Yeah, some work that I've been doing with community integrated care. Um, so initially from conversations with John Hughes, um, he'd seen earlier work that that I'd done with SURF, the SURF Dementia Group in Liverpool, and was talking, you know, for some period of time about doing something on a similar sort of basis with people working in social care and the different aspects and how you know, maybe um, how the media had portrayed social care. And obviously it's a story that's popping up, it seems, so much at the moment. Um, and so then John contacted me um, last maybe November, October, November time. Because um, obviously at this time, it's you know, highlighted these different issues and, you know, the people that work in social care are sometimes maybe um, how they're portrayed as being sort of overlooked. And so, um, yeah, it seemed like that had been highlighted during the during the pandemic. So, um, yeah, there was numerous sort of conversations working with John, trying to work out, you know, who we could work with as well. So initially, initially started with the Zoom meetings and discussions with different members of staff, trying to get an idea of, you know, myself trying to get an idea of, um, you know, the roles that different people played and different members of staff and um, the work they undertook and also you know quite a lot of um yeah the sort of sacrifices that um you know trying to share these different experiences from these initial conversations through zoom um so also i suppose just going back and um, this first image was from a conversation i had with mark um a couple of weeks ago so it was also, you know, thinking about going back to that time of February 2020 and the, um, I suppose the the element of, you know, uncertainty and, you know, what was happening at that time. Um, you know, also he spoke about the worry and also this, that this virus was, you know, coming our way, like it says here from this quote. Um, so this, this work isn't absolutely finished at the moment. It's still, you know, there's, it's at the sort of final stages. And um, so there's still, you know, lots of quotes that we're sort of working on and trying to um, finalize the different images. Uh, so I suppose the original idea that John spoke about was to take five portraits, uh, work with five different people um, from, you know, various uh, members of staff and different residents. Um, and it sort of turned into a bigger sort of project. Um, so I suppose, yeah, that, that initial uncertainty when, um, you know, the lockdown was announced. So Mark spoke about, um, you know, going into lockdown two weeks before the government's official lockdown and then trying to put things in place. Um, so there's also some other quotes as well from the government at the time, um, you know, the discussions around PPE as well. Um, and the numerous, I suppose, quotes that were used and that have become, 
more well known um, regarding PPE, regarding care homes um, that, you know, may be included um, with the work as well. Um, so this is an image. So hopefully, let's see if I can do this. Hopefully you can see this full screen as well. Um, so yeah, Mark spoke about, you know, taking over a certain room within their main offices and it turning into what he described as the war room. So at that time, you know, great uncertainty. Mark, maybe if you want to add a little bit about, you know, that time itself. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Tag. It, it was very interesting at that time because you, at the end of February, you had um, Bob Boris Johnson going to the Cheltenham Gold Cup. You had Atletico Madrid playing Liverpool in Merseyside with thousands of Spaniards coming into town. Um, and yet all around the world, you could see the virus spreading. And it, and it felt like, it, you know, we were living in some kind of alternative reality where some people were kind of carrying on pretending this wasn't happening. And we had, you know, so many thousands of you know, vulnerable people that we just felt that we couldn't waste a minute in, in terms of, uh, you know, starting to prepare for what we, we felt was inevitable. Um, you know, you, you'll remember that in those early months, uh, there was an absolute chronic shortage of PPE. Um, you know, we, we worked very hard and used the size and strength of the charity to make sure that we had enough supplies. But I think the key thing was making sure that there was almost kind of daily guidance going out to our team, just so that they they knew what to wear and when. Uh, they knew, you know, that we had to kind of ask visitors not to, to, to come to homes until we were clear as to what the situation was going to unfold into. Um, and we just transferred some of our best managers and directors into a war, war room who basically um, from day one were just trying to second guess the virus. And at that time there was a lot of unknowns and it was quite scary. Okay, thanks for that. So I, I didn't say as well that, um, so yeah, lots of these different, um, you know, things that we spoke about um, and different themes were discussed and then restaged. So these are different sort of you know, there's some images that are staged, there are some images that some of the people involved took, and other members of, um, you know, staff took as well, so it's quite a mixture of different different images. Um, so also this is Neil's story, so Neil, um, well, you know, one, one aspect of his story was that he felt, um, you know, really responsible towards the members of um, his family, but also the residents in the care home. So he actually lived in a motor home next to the care home itself for three months. Um, so this is the motor home. So the member of staff um, who worked in that care home, you know, drove the motor home out of um, out of the sort of lockup that it was in. And so we restaged this this image of Neil. Um, so yeah, he spent three months living in this care home um, and talked about the long sort of walks back home because he didn't feel he didn't feel like he wanted to put himself obviously in, in danger of contacting the virus. Um, so we would walk home. Sometimes he said it would like take two or three hours. Um, and he said, yeah, that sorry, the uh, the main sort of memory for him was walking back and the only thing he could hear was the sound of um, bird song and sirens during that time. So this is an image of him living in the care home. So this is an image that his partner took as well when he went to visit his family on one of these many, many, you know, walks back. So this is his daughter in the behind the window as well. And this is an image with the on one of the walks that he took. So it's trying to show these different elements from the different members of staff and their personal experience. Um, so these are three residents um, from Mill Point. Um, so out in the forest, so we also, you know, there's another aspect of the government sort of, you know, overlooking certain 
um, you know, individuals. And there was some reports as well that have discussed about people being left behind, people with disabilities being left behind. So there's this idea of, you know, people being sort of left behind um, in this forest. So this is also another staged image. Um, so this is leading on to Oliver, uh, who was recruited by Community Integrated Care um, during the pandemic. He's taken on the role of sports inclusion assistant. And so his role is to mentor and encourage others to engage in activity programs. Um, so also named the ambassador for the Rugby League World Cup in 2021. And um, so Craig and Oliver are are here hopefully online. And um, so this is a quote from Craig as well, talking about his brother. Oliver is a very aspirational young man. It's something that's driven him for a while is he's always wanted to have a job. He's always wanted a relationship. He loves playing sport. He likes going to the pub with his mates, things like that, that we kind of take a little bit for granted. Um, so then this is an image. So do you want to, I don't know if you can speak a little and unmute um, Craig or Oliver. Yeah, that's fine. Um, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I think this is real big, um, almost like a contrast, really, from, from what Mark was mentioning earlier, in that, you know, this Oliver was recruited to the charity, um, sort of during the midst of that second lockdown. Um, and I think it really shows the, shows the strength of the charity and, and the social care sector that I think the easiest thing in the world would have been to delay Oliver's appointment um, because of everything that was going on but all of, we, we knew what a, an impact Oliver would have uh, on the charity and it was sort of almost a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel that we would we'd still bring Oliver on and, and he would flourish as he has done um, and it, I think that picture really is, is really powerful because um, I'm, I'm Oliver's line manager but I'm also his older brother so I know him particularly well and I think him Centre stage at a big stadium with a rock style look of a leather jacket, but also getting people encouraged into taking part in activities. That's what he's about. Um, and I think that really does sum him up quite spectacularly. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for that. Um, so I'm trying to go through. So this is um, yeah, a quote from Boris Johnson that. Um, yeah, we discovered too many care homes didn't really follow procedures in the way that they could have, but we're learning lessons the whole time. One of the most important things is to fund them properly. So this was one quote that, um, yeah, sort of annoyed quite a lot of members of staff um, that I spoke to as well. Um, yeah, it wasn't really obviously a beneficial quote to hear at the time. You know, these people were working under a lot of stress. Um, obviously, you know, it's trying to show some of these different scenarios, um, like Neil living in the in the motor home, um, and also some other, you know, positive aspects of the um, during the pandemic and what you know other members of staff did to help with, you know, some of the um, residents in the different homes. Um, so this is Francis, Shack Lady. So he. He said um, when he was, you know, during the initial lockdown, um, you know, he'd be going out and doing shopping in full PPE and members of staff would you know, criticise him because he was buying, you know, it seems kind of weird now, but thinking back to sort of April 2020 and arguments almost in shops about if people were limited to buying one loaf of bread or whatever it may be. And he talked about, um, you yeah, being criticized and openly yeah spoken to in shops about about doing the shopping in full ppe um, and then having these discussions saying i'm you know i'm buying this for the care home that i work in so it's almost yeah trying to show these different aspects to other members of the public that i suppose maybe we overlook um also this quote from matt hancock um, so, yeah, sorry, this quote from Matt Hancock, Matt Hancock about throwing a protective ring around the care homes. Um, and then from another discussion with John, he was talking about in one care home, this is Tony on an airbed. 
So yeah, it's a slightly unusual picture, but quite a number of these pictures were made during the lockdown um, earlier this year as well. So John spoke about embracing these restrictions. So rather than, I was sort of thinking, you know, we may have to wait until, you know, the restrictions are lifted and then we can, you know, try different attempts, but he was, you know, and he was correct. It's sort of making those restrictions part of the work. So Tony lived, um, well, slept on this airbed because I think 10 members of staff, um, you know, many were isolating, um, some were become ill. And so they needed to provide 24 hour care. So they were reduced to, I think, three or four members of staff. And so Tony slept on the air bed in the office during this time. And so, you know, this it's not like a protective ring that the government put around, you know, the members of staff or the care homes. You know, it was these staff that were helping each other. Um, so that's what this this image was trying to portray as well. But, you know, them working together to help each other, and to help the members of, and residents, you know, in the different in the different homes. Um, so also um, at Mill Point, you know, they were trying to, you know, Mark also spoke about some of the difficulties of when people were then, um, you know, wearing masks and in full PPE in the different homes. Um, and then people, you know, who may not understand why suddenly this person they know quite well is you know, wearing these visors and masks and so on. And so, John spoke about, you know, some of the really great work that, um, you know, the different care homes were doing to try and, you know, entertain or work with the, um, with the residents as well in these difficult, really difficult times. So these are a number of um, portraits. Again, these are with restrictions in place. So they're all taken in the same, you know, in the garden, but trying to use different props um, with the different individuals and how they, you know, dealt with the sort of the lockdown earlier this year. So this is Francis on the right with Paul. And Paul, who's a massive Elvis fan. Um, another care home, one of the ladies passed away. Um, Bessie was her name. Um, so this is a quote from Debbie, um, who works at the, the care home as well. So also the difficulty of losing a member of, you know, one of the residents and then the other residents trying to, you know, sort of comprehend, um, you know, that, that individual who passed away. It's kind of difficult talking about, there's so many different aspects in this short space of time. Um, so this was an email that I sent to Debbie. She sent me some archival image that I'll show you in a minute because I've got, there's an online exhibition that I'll try and show. Um, so yeah, this is an email saying, thanks Debbie, to you. if you have any more, these would be great you know, to give an idea of Bessie because um, we were talking about in some way, you know, trying to include Bessie in the work as well. Um, and then, yeah, Debbie responded that, Bessie didn't have any family. So I'm going to, you know, there aren't images included on this, but I'm going to include them um, in the online presentation. So can you just give me one second? I'm now going to try and link up. Um, this online gallery that I created. Um, just give me one second. Did work 25 minutes ago. Should work. Okay, so hopefully you can see there's an image bound frayed. Yeah, yeah, we can see the gallery. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so again, so like I said, initially the um the idea was to you know photograph five different individuals showing these different aspects of working social care. And then it was also trying to maybe, um, so these are, this is just in the Northwest. So I'd spoken to John as well, and there's a possibility, you know, I'm not sure about it becoming a nation, 
you know, a national sort of project as well in different areas of the country. Um, so this was an online gallery that I've put together that's, um, you know, to try and show other members um, of staff as well about, you know, how the work could could be shown as well as in an online form. Um, so also just this working sort of title, Bound and Frayed. So there's, you know, the element of um, rope, um, you know, this idea of, you know, people being bound together, like the members of staff being bound and working together, but also this element of frayed, because, you know, so many of these people that I was working with, um, you know, they're under a lot of stress. And obviously, you know, that, that was one of the difficulties, I suppose, trying to work with different people. You know, the original people that we discussed, some people couldn't do it for, you know, so many different reasons um, and realize, you know, this, this project is not, obviously not a priority. And um, we just wanted to quickly show, you know, this online exhibition to show some of these different elements. And there's some other images that, um, you know, how the text and image can work together. Um, and I can obviously reach a wider audience as well. Um, so, it, but since I've put this together, there's other images that have been included. So it needs to be, yeah, sort of readdressed and other images need, need to be added. And um, I suppose with many projects, these things can grow and grow. So these are all the different residents from yeah, a number of different, different homes. Um, so this one doesn't quite line up with Matt Hancock's quote. I'm not sure why. Um, so again, yeah, these are some of the other images that I've shown with little interviews with each of the residents. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll just move on to the others of Bessie. Um, so yeah, these are the, the emails that I, you know, showed a minute ago, and then these are, you know, lots of the images that members of staff took of Bessie. Um, so it's showing, you know, all the different activities that the the members of staff were doing, um, because like Debbie said, Bessie didn't have any family of her own. Also, this final picture of Bessie as a young girl. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop that. How am I doing for time? Am I okay? Yes, you're fine for time. Okay. Um, one second. Okay, sorry, just give me a second. Just need to get this other image up and running. So yeah, I also wanted to show um, sorry, I've got about five different things going on at the moment. Um, so these other images um, so hopefully this is an image of Gina. Yeah, you can see Gina. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so yeah, the other work with community integrated care is closer to um, you know the finished sort of that part working with those individuals in the northwest. So the work with surf um, is at the much earlier sort of stages. So just to show one or two images from other work, when I met up initially, I didn't know anything about dementia, and then met up with different members of the surf dementia group trying to show to raise awareness around dementia and to try and show you know different aspects to, to, to try and remove some of the stigma so this is an image of gina so gina spoke about words sort of her not being able to grasp certain words in conversations and um, so after a number of different you know meetings so this is you know a few years ago and um, trying to show these different elements so this was trying to you know, create a visual image that touches on that subject that, 
Gina was struggling with trying to grab a certain word or a word that's just out of reach. So these are like withdrawn library books flying through the air in, a dis, in an abandoned um, in the Lister Drive library in Liverpool. So this is Roy and he spoke about um, one time when he went to a restaurant and a member of staff made a member, sorry, of the, the public um, made a comment. And so he sort of threw this soup on the floor as a way of escaping this situation. So it was restaging some of these different scenarios um, and trying to look at other aspects of dementia rather than, I suppose the public's perception of dementia is just about memory, but it was trying to show these many, many different aspects depending on, you know, there's so many different types of dementia. So I don't know if Sarah, if you want to add a little comment about this as well. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> when we initially kind of started the work time, it was very much the, the idea around trying to help raise awareness of the fact that there's more to dementia than just memory. So some of the more unusual aspects. So for instance, th this idea of, um, you know, not, not being able to recognize objects, which, which Roy was kind of portraying here and the frustration that goes with that. And also, like you mentioned with Gina, not being able to um, kind of pick out the words. I think as a clinician, it was really interesting to work alongside Tig with this and to kind of think about how we, we manage the kind of NHS restraints alongside that. So, you know, I think that if anyone in the NHS knew that I had a lady with dementia in an abandoned library and was throwing books at her head, I probably wouldn't be working here right now, but um, we let Tig do that actually instead. In fact, we let her husband throw books at her head rather than Tig. Yeah. Um, as they weren't aimed at her head, they went above her head. But I think the for me, the and Roy touched on this in his introductions of how the power of photography can portray something that I can't tell people. Um, so certainly I know you might go on to say this type, but when we had these exhibited, the conversations that came from the public around it were far more powerful than the conversations I can have with people if I just ask people if they want to know more about dementia. So I think from, from my perspective, there was that kind of sense. And what we took from this was the individual experience. And I know Tiger will go to talk on that we want to build on that for this next project about the relationships and collective nature of dementia as well. So yeah. Yeah, and maybe um, Roy, did you want to add anything about this as well? About, I suppose, maybe from the initial idea of the project and how it developed? Well, initially, Ty, I thought, oh, this is great. But as time went on, I slowly but surely began to understand what it was all about. And then when we actually put the it was weekend, wasn't it, at the Tate Gallery? Yeah, the amount of members of the public flow through that Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, and being able to talk to people and try and explain what using the vast amounts of photography that we produced at the photographic exhibition, what it's actually like to live with dementia, how the disease affects you in day to day life. And then to educate and try and remove the stigma. I thought it was um, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant piece of work that you created with the help of the Open Eye Gallery and so on. That's, I think it went a long way, I think, to uh, make people understand. And several thousand people came through that exhibition over the, over the weekend. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. So it also, I suppose it did take a bit of time to get an idea, because I didn't know anything about dementia, really. And then from speaking to you and the other participants, it took a while to get an idea of how the project would develop. And so maybe that's what's going to, maybe that's what's going to happen with the next part. Because if you remember, I remember you spoke about, you know, when I was trying different images and you were across the road at the bus stop and I was in your house taking pictures and that was me trying to work out you know what I'm, how, how is this going to work how are we going to tell these different stories so there was quite a bit of experimentation the help we got with the Merseyside police as well to produce some stuff as well yeah and I suppose there is this 
perception in the public's mind of what somebody living with dementia maybe is. And I think when this, um, you know, when these images were shown, people don't initially think, it doesn't obviously, you know, say sort of dementia, but when you get an understanding of what, what the image is trying to portray, then people are sort of drawn in. Because I think when it was shown in the Tate Liverpool as well, you know, there was the picture of this woman with these books and people were like, what's going on in this picture? And they're intrigued. Because I know, I think Sarah's had an experience as well. And um, and Roy, when we went out, so we produced a newspaper with this and then went out um, and one day went to Morrison's to hand out newspapers and a member of the public, um, I handed this newspaper to this lady because we wanted to try and, you know, remove this stigma, to try and remove the stigma and raise awareness about these different aspects. And the first lady that I handed the newspaper to said, why have you targeted me? Do you think I've got dementia? Yeah. So there's quite a mm. stigma still, I suppose, and it's trying to show these different aspects. You know, I think having those images really helps with this because before now, I know we certainly, Mercy Care sent me and, and various other colleagues out into places and put us places, whether it's in a shopping center or wherever to talk, try and talk to the public about dementia. Um, and I think I'm fairly approachable, you know, it's um, not that scary. And people literally run away from you when you kind of say, oh, do you want to come talk about your memory? You know, nobody wants to talk to you. So actually having a medium to allow us to do that feels so helpful and so useful. I suppose it's slightly different when people go into a gallery or a museum, they're going in with a kind of open mind to mm -hmm. different experiences of whatever they're looking at, but going into, um, yeah, supermarket, I suppose, you know, it's a different, it's a different sort of yeah, situation approaching people in that way. Um, so yeah, I suppose from these different discussions, this is Tommy. Um, so I was also trying to show, you know, people still being independent and, you know, going out and, you know, doing different social sort of activities as well. So there was different, a number of different things that we were trying to show. So with this new work, so these are, this is an image of, Roy and Stan in Roy's kitchen. So this was just done a few weeks ago. But to get to this point, we had, um, yeah, I suppose numerous sort of Zoom meetings and discussions. And Sarah spoke more about, it's more about the sort of relationships that have been built um, with the different members of the CERF group. And so it's going to be more a talking sort of project at the moment. So it's also, um, yeah, these are sort of at early stages. So these are tests in Roy's flat. Um, so it's going to be numerous conversations with different people. And also, I suppose the other thing that's important is this, uh, this aspect of um, something being useful. So we spoke about, um, you know, with the other project, there was a, um, there was a, a newspaper that was produced. So we've spoken about the idea of an activity booklet that would, you know, help people. Um, Sarah, do you want to speak a little about this? You know, the different. Yeah, I guess it was the idea of helping people think about their own social networks, because we know that the relationships yeah. we have with other people are vitally important to the way we feel about ourselves. And I think all of us can probably recognise during the pandemic, actually, that when relationships are threatened and when we're not able to engage in those things, it threatens the way we feel about ourselves as well. Um, and that can be doubly impacted when we're living with dementia. So we were kind of thinking of an activity booklet that will help people think about their own social network and how to create new social networks, potentially, um, with the idea of concentric circles that so your world getting smaller and then your world expanding back out again so Ty and I got very carried away with bits of paper that we cut up but we think probably something <laughs> more professional than that would be better <laughs> rather than us with a pair of scissors and um, a glue gun but there is something um just about helping people have these conversations as well because for a lot of people there's an image in your head of dementia being a very lonely isolative condition and actually what we want to show is the communities and the relationships. So, you know, here we're starting with kind of Roy and Stan as people who have become really close friends through having a diagnosis of dementia, didn't know each other before that, but also expanding out to the wider kind of relationship. So there's other people here today who are also in Stan and Roy's social network and who, and including, you know, myself, Ty, Liz, we're all kind of within that as well. There's this sense of who who is 
um, who's the community there. Um, so I guess that's where we're, we're going in and helping other people. So the use, this kind of legacy of it, being helping other people have those kind of conversations as well and start to kind of develop that. So. And also, I suppose, um, you know, from working with other groups and other projects and, you know, <laughs> slightly further away from Liverpool, um, you know, the, the, the care is quite different in other parts of the country. So I think even though I think you're pretty humble about it, modest, say, around Jill, you know, in other parts of the country, this, this doesn't happen. So I've spoken to other groups and they're like, can we have a surf group? How can we do that? Can we could we do something like that? So um, I suppose, yeah, part of this is also, you know, the conversation, this was like testing different elements and recording and you know, using moving image and testing audio and so on, but the conversations that Roy and Stan were having about, you know, so many different aspects, you know, when people hear those, it's, it goes against this sort of more stereotypical idea of people living with dementia. So that's that's the idea behind that. Um, so also, yeah, I just wanted to end with this picture of Stan on his um, scooter that he turned up with to um, meet with Roy. Easy rider there. So. Yeah, I know. It's like he took off at quite a speed. Um, okay, so I think, is there anything else you wanted to add, Roy? Um, not, not, not really. It's just, it amazes me how, I was always very dubious of these projects to start with in photography. But as time's gone on, I've come to realise the situations you've put me in, up hills and God knows where else, and how this medium can really ram its phone to people that you can live a you can live successfully with dementia. You shouldn't feel an outcast. And, that I'm still the same person, but perhaps I, I act sometimes in different ways than I, perhaps I, I used to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I noticed that at the Tate Gallery, people were genuinely interested. They'd come up to you, they'd chat, they'd look at one of the huge photographs. And when you started to explain to them, it was obvious that they were taking more and more interest. You know, obviously they did come across people with dementia in their families, but they didn't really fully understand it. And I think it just went, with some people, it went a long way to give them. I think when they came through the gallery and left the gallery, I think they had a bit better understanding that, like Sarah said, it's not just memory, it's many other um, aspects of how they these diseases can affect you. And also, I think, you know, when when you did that talk in the taste, there was a student at that at that talk, and he was just kind of like looking at you going, so does he have dementia? So how can he have dementia, you know, do well, this talk and walk around the taste? Many, many times where people have said to me, even fam family members, well, do you think you should be doing this? Should you be doing A, B, C, and D. Well, why not? Yeah, As yeah. A winner here, we can make all people understand that I'm still the same person. I might act inappropriately sometimes. Stand up to cancer, why not stand up to dementia? What's the difference? There isn't. Yeah, yeah. Um... So I think that was about it for the moment for the presentation, but I suppose as well, it's thinking how it can develop as well. So these are like early tests. So if we think of the other shots initially of Roy and Gina and the portraits, it changed quite a lot. So it may change quite a lot as we work on this Roy as well, Sarah. That's the, the scary bit, but also the exciting bit. It's both. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've, we're kind of, dare I say, we're running exactly to time. How good is I this? Know. I know. Yes. So we have, we have a couple of options. Um, 
Would people appreciate a 10 minute break? Or would people be quite keen to carry on and we might finish a little early? It's entirely up to the majority, I guess. Or those that shout the loudest to let me know what they prefer. What time does it finish, Liz? We were going to be finished by half two, but if but if we carry straight on, we might finish a bit earlier. So it's up to you. Yeah, yeah I need to get away at two o'clock. I've got another Zoom on the horizon. So well, should we carry on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe is, just carry on. Is everyone happy just I to carry on? I wouldn't be able to stay that long. I'll have to bob out. Okay, so yeah, we'll stay. We'll carry on then if that's it. Yeah, okay, then. We'll, okay. we'll stay on. If people okay. need to leave at any point, though, that's totally fine. Just, just nip out and come back or... or or leave and, and don't come back. Don't come back. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of wanted to open it up to the to the whole room now. Um, I did have some initial questions that have been sent in either through um, other people at Open Eye Gallery or people that couldn't attend today, but kind of sent questions <laughs> to ask anyway. So I do have some questions, but does anybody have a question in the room just now they'd like to ask to any of the speakers um, before I ask the ones I've got listed? Shall I start then and see what we come with after? Yeah. So I yeah. so I had a question um, for Mark actually, and and maybe actually from from the community integrated care um, members of staff and representatives here as well. Um, just a question. Someone was asking after seeing the images that have been produced so far, what role do you see photography now playing within your sector, uh, and what maybe are your aspirations for what might happen with the work that's been made? So I don't know if, I mean, I like to pick on people, so I'll pick on Mark first, that feels fair. Thanks, so I didn't to, yeah, yeah. add in as well. Yeah, no, happy, happy to be picked on. No, I, I mean, um, I mean, I'm familiar with photography. I'm, I'm married to a professional photographer for a start. Um, and it, it can obviously convey stories um, and emotions that it's hard to, to convey in words. Um, I mean, we've gone through as a sector, um, you know, what people that have been in social care a lot longer than I have have told me is the hardest period in 30 or 40 years. Um, you know, we've had we've had people on the front line, you know, putting their their own family second in order to provide support and protection to those that they they support uh, on a daily basis. And even though, you know, through COVID, you know, we had the clap for the NHS that was then kind of changed to clap for carers, it, it felt like that was like a, a, a transition and it's kind of in the past. Um, but for social care at the moment, it's not in the past. You know, the COVID is still there. People are still having to wear PPE. They still have to focus on protecting the people that they support. And I think anything that tells the story keeps um, uh, an understanding fresh is very powerful. Uh, so you know, look, look, looking forward to seeing what you and and Todd decide to do next in terms of you know com completing completing the piece of work and and then you know how do we, how do we let as many people as possible see it? Thank you, Mark. Craig, Craig or Oliver, do you want to add anything in? Um, just to piggyback on the, on the sort of powerful motion, um, you know, looking through Tyke's work then, and I've heard that story about Neil countless times across the charity, and I still saw that picture and I actually cried <laughs> because it's just, that's the power that picture has. And I think for someone who, who knows that story, I know that story already and I've spoken to Tyke about that already. But for me to have that sort of, reaction to it I think that trans that will translate that into people who maybe don't know those sort of stories and will be much more powerful upon people seeing that rather than just an anecdotal story that social care workers are, are working tirelessly and work so hard on you know particularly on that front line and um, I think they say pictures speaks a thousand words don't they but I think that's maybe a underestimation Thank you. Okay. Oh, we have a, we have a, I love this card. I've not seen this used before. This might be a new thing. Um, I'm just checking, is that, did Oliver want to say anything? Are you all right, Oliver? Yeah, um, I've just seen um, Tag's um, picture of me 
um, with me, it's like, hey, I'm a sports inclusion assistant, and to like get people involved into sports, um, and like sort of like, like sort of rugby, um, as as Ty said about the about the about the World Cup. So as you can see as well, so so I'm the player of the of, so I'm the player of the one to one team of the rugby and and I get to um try to help people into their into their into their zone where they can have awareness that that so with my help I help their potential and their awareness where I can say, right, let's do something else or let's do this. And they listen to me or the coaches. And it's just about being the part being the part of the biggest team and and why some of my picks are there on the on the presentation of tags. It's not it's not just about me. But it's just about people with with learning disability. Does it mean that you are? It's just about being the perfect thing for for, for the big event like the pictures that that those pictures where Tig put on. And it's just about dreams that that have come true. And it's not just about being you are. This is how how things are, and for me, it just moves how it how it saw me there from a rubber ball, and it's just like I'm the next superstar. Well, it could be anyone on on here on the open eye in gallery, and it's just how people might get that that sense to be playing rugby. Or of doing a different subject like this, it's been like giving that awareness as well, and just to make sure people know who you are, why you're doing it, and it's for the right cause as well. Great, thank you so much, Oliver. Okay. Um, it's it was one. Of, I mean, I shouldn't have favourites, but it was one of my favourite pictures. But I think it might have been the, the leather jacket that did it. Actually, the addition yeah. of the. Leather well, but it was I, a real superstar. Yeah, I, well, I've set up put on my sports stuff really, but since I've um, so I put my put my jacket on, I thought let's just go for it. So that's what we did. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Oliver. Next one is. Um, I think I think Paul, you had your sign, your sign up, which I was impressed with. Yeah, I think I forgot what I was going to say. Now just let me. Uh, what was it? Oh yeah. Um, Oh yeah, the, uh, thanks for that, Oliver. I enjoyed your little speech there. Well done. The um, what are you going to say? Oh well, yeah, we're talking to um, get to get back what Mark said about you know the end game, trying to get things into the media is the hardest thing. I think I've had conversations with Sarah many Sarah many times over this. How do we do this? How do we do that? And, and really, um, you know, if 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 you could get I don't know, some kind of professional BA people in to do it. Be a lot easier because um, if, if you don't know any, if you don't know any celebrities or you don't know how to approach the media, then it, it becomes really, really difficult. And I think, you know, throughout the conversations today, that, that that's going to be the hardest part of um, of doing things, you know, make, getting the awareness out there, getting the, the photographs out there. Um, yeah, that's all I was going to say, really. Thank Paul. I think we have had conversations before. And I think you, you're right that there is something there about photography, isn't there? That the producing really powerful images is a way that yeah. the public can interact with things if if we can get them out there in the right way yeah. that other mediums don't. So, you know, they the, people can really take a lot from a photograph, can't they? And having powerful images is so important. And if we want to get messages out there, I think that is the way. But you're right. I know you've, you've talked about this a lot, Paul, and I think something we should all kind of think about. How do we 
yeah. make sure that the work that we do and the messages that are so important within those pieces of work are getting heard really widely. And I know, Liz, obviously you, that's on your mind as well, how work gets out there, isn't it? And things so. Yeah, yeah and, and and especially with Open Eye Gallery, you know, we have our we have our physical space, we have our gallery program, but a huge percentage of the work we do is actually off site. And we're always thinking about where where is it appropriate that work is shown, like what's the purpose, what's the reason? So is it much more relevant that it's on the high street? Should it be in shopping centres? Should it be in local community centres, GP surgeries? Like where where's the work relevant? I guess who are we trying to reach? But but yeah, there is the kind of biggie of of the mainstream media, which we know is mainstream. And so everybody watches it. So yeah, thinking ahead about how we tap into that is really interesting actually. Because you're right, they're the biggies that we can that we can push these conversations through. Um yeah, a, a job, a job for us to think about, I think, <laughs> with everybody else. Um great, thank you. Um I think I had another has anyone else got a question or comment? Still got some more that were were listed to ask if People are okay for time. Yeah. Okay, so the next one was for um, Ty, actually. So there was a question from someone that said, having worked with um, either group on the project so far, have this, has there been anything that's been reinforced or challenged around your perceptions at all of this notion of, of what we've been talking about, of who's left behind? Um, and what's the most interesting thing you've taken away from the project so far? Um, I suppose, yeah, from speaking to, you know, the other members of staff um, from community integrated care, you know, there were certain things that, um, yeah, the, you know, the government said, that's why, you know, some of those quotes were included as well, it didn't really help. Um, and it's almost you know overlooking the fact that these people um you know worked really really pretty hard it's kind of overlooked i think um you know that aspect because it's difficult thinking back to you know the initial lockdown of you know march 2020 20, sorry march 2020 and you know lots of people were you know at home and working and so on and they had to continue online in some way but lots well mainly nearly everyone you know you know working in in the different homes had all these different complications and difficulties that they had to you know just sort of continue the work that they were doing i suppose um and i think it was um yeah from initial discussions from john and speaking about these different aspects it's hearing these you know these personal stories was trying to you you know incorporate those in the work as well um and I suppose that was, um, you know, the most interesting part because so many people, because I'm, you know, I'm working as well as a photography tutor and lots of the, the work was just then online, speaking to students and, you know, doing, working on tutorials and so on. Um, but yeah, there were so many people that had to continue in, you know, really quite a scary and stressful time because it was, it was that element of unknown. You know, the last year and a half has been so bizarre, really. Um, and the sort of fear, I suppose, in, back in March, April 2020, is kind of difficult to, you know, it seems so long ago, but it was, it was really so, yeah, such a difficult time. Um, so I think, has that, has that answered the question, maybe in a roundabout way? Um, hopefully. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it, was quite, it was quite a long question, I, I respect that. Um, I guess there's just one more question that I had, if that's okay, and then we might be able to round up unless anyone else has got any um, specific things they want to mention. Um, but this one was to Sarah Butchard and Roy. Um, is how, how have you found working on this new project? So this second project, which is more around, like you're saying, these community networks and building and, and, and evidencing social networks, I guess, is, is part of that. You want to start, Roy, because my dogs are going wild downstairs. So I'm going to keep myself on mute for a minute. So. I think being involved in the, certainly the project about dementia and everything that went along with that, it's just given me encouragement, I think, to know that it 
if you can just change the mindset of one person, you're on a winner. It's helped me feel personally that I can still get involved in, in this type of work. I'm thinking that it might help other generations to come have to live with dementia. You know, if we can improve their lot, well, it's all been worthwhile in a way. Could be my daughter, my son, one day. Sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional. It's just no, but I think I think that's really important, Roy, because I think that that's something that taps into this, isn't it? That actually, it is emotional, and I think you know. Craig saying before that you see the photos and I think I've seen those photos of Gina and Roy multiple times but every time I see them kind of it it is emotive and it brings something because photography does something different to you than me even me sitting in a room I sit in a room all day every day and hear people's stories that's what I do for a living but there's something about seeing it in that way isn't it and that visualization of it that that feels very different and I think embarking on this project feels slightly different to the last one because you know we hadn't met Tyke before then it was all a little bit unknown I think this this time it felt we're starting from a different point um but, but I found ourselves in very much the same position which I think is quite interesting so you know Tyke and I met like as we were coming out of lockdown I was very I was a little bit overexcited because it was one of the first times I'd met someone who hadn't seen for a while in person because we don't live far from each other and it was like this is so exciting <laughs> so but there's this sense of there is an excitement, isn't there, about barking on a new project, um, but also that sense of us being in exactly the same position as we were last time, of where is this going to go? And I think that's the exciting part of this. And for me, yeah. it's always the exciting part of doing any kind of co-production work. So I don't think you'd mind me saying, Roy, that yourself, other members, Julie's still here, I think, um, other members of the group that we work with, none of you are, are afraid to tell us if something isn't working in the way that you think it should be working. Um, and that, yeah, yeah, like I was thumbs up from Julie about that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not afraid to do that. And I think that's why it works so well, because actually this it is then true co-production, isn't it? Um, and I'm getting the sense, Oliver, that if you hadn't been happy with Tyg's photos, you would have told him. Um, <laughs> and there's that sense of, I've really appreciated Tyg having that openness to it as well. Um, I think kind of learned something from that. Yeah, yeah Roy. You don't mind me jumping in. I think what amazes me with you, Ty, you knew absolutely and utterly nothing about dementia. <laughs> you must have thought, what am I getting involved in here? You're just brilliant. And a lot of patience as well, with the likes of me and other people with dementia. I have to say that. Well, I suppose when it started, I did, yeah, I didn't know anything whatsoever. Yeah. And I was, you know, driving to the open eye gallery thinking, What's this meet going to be like? What's going to happen? And then talking to you, and you're talking about seeing the Beatles and so on. And you're talking about Stella Black at the, well, I can't remember the name of the place she was, where she was the, um, you know, working in the cloakroom. And there was this really funny conversation because you were telling, you know, it was, and then I was thinking, how am I going to photograph this? Because it's not like visual. So, you know, there were so many different sort of challenges, I suppose. Because it must have been a nightmare for you. <laughs> but it, it evolved and it developed as time yeah. on, so yeah. and a lot so of I think that's a lot of trust both ways. Yeah, yeah. Because initially, remember when it was shown at the um, at the Tate, and there was that talk, and you said, "Well, I didn't want to tell you, Ty, but we thought it was going to be a pile of <laughs> rubbish." rubbish. But you didn't tell me that at the time. So you just said, well, you seem yeah. like a nice guy. So we just continued with it. <laughs> so that's how, that's how they can sort of change, I suppose, you know, throughout the project. You start at one point and how, yeah. hopefully find your way. But it's kind of a bit of a, you know, the unsure element is is a bit scary because yeah. you don't know, you, don't, you can't see an end point. It is, and I think we're still at that stage, aren't we? This one, a little bit unsure, a little bit like, where do we go? But we know it will yeah. go somewhere really good, but it feels there's more pressure in some ways because we know it worked last time. So yeah. we're starting from a slightly That's, different point, but it's exciting. Yeah, I'm just I'm just saying that sort of like, so at one point, if you think, what the heck is going on, Tyg? It's sort of just trying to find the direction, maybe. And it, and it takes, 
that's for the totally time. <laughs> <laughs> but also it, it's like what Sarah mentioned as well as that even though that second project is about those social networks and those friendships actually it's really resonant with all of these projects is a thing around actually how people and their own social networks have kept each other going through really difficult times um, and I think that's something that's going to come through from both projects in a really positive way, actually. Um, so kind of the importance of trust, resilience and friendship. Um, yeah, it's, it's been wonderful to have both the projects together, actually, for the first time to, and for hopefully for you guys to make new more social networks as well across each other. Um, did anyone else have any other comments or questions just before we round up? Oh, I think Oliver, yeah. Yeah, um, can I just ask a question to my brother Craig or Mark? Um, how so? How of the so out of of the um of the presentation, what what type did so through so, so throughout to community throughout to community integrated care to Craig Thomason and Mark. Um how how did it how did you how did you both feel that by by, by working through to to community through to community integrated care and see and see how 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 does it make make people feel to see their face to see their faces on the presentation. What do you mean? So just so we get this question right, mate. Yeah. How do we how do we feel seeing those pictures? Is that from how does it make us feel about working for the charity? Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Yeah, can you be you so, or Mark? Yeah. Well, apart from your one, because I see your face all the time, all the time. Well, apart from that one. Uh, apart from that one. Uh, apart from that, it just made me feel really, really proud to be working for this charity and within this sector. Um, and I think it sh it shows how uh, strong and how brave a lot of the well, all of our colleagues are um, within community integrated care. And it just yeah, I think proud is the word. Um, I'm proud of the change that the charity is trying to make in the sector as well. Thank, yeah, well, thanks Oliver and uh, thanks Craig. Um, I mean, the, I mean the first thing is. Uh, I don't see your photograph quite as much as Craig Oliver, but you are slight, slightly starting to take over the charity. And I was really sorry that I wasn't with you in, Lon in London last week. But um, um, I mean, I, I think that one of, one of the things that strikes me is how, how it personalizes and humanizes um, individuals. Um, I mean, you know, you in your leather jacket, um, you know, Roy just living a normal life with friends around him, um, you know, contributing and guiding others. I, I think it, it's quite an important message. You know, we're all human beings with strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, you know, we, we, people shouldn't be marginalised or left behind. Um, and the, the fact that, you know, someone like yourself, Oliver, is front and centre of everything we do. It just makes me want to have you know more more of um, the people we support and more of the colleagues we work with doing exactly the same, uh, and really sharing this to as wide an audience as possible. But uh, no, I, I agree with Craig. It uh, it makes you proud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's very thanks. I know Oliver, you didn't ask me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna. Hopefully, it's okay if I answer a little bit anyway. That I what's really struck me from hearing both of the projects together today is, and I think Liz just touched on it, and. I'd put something in the chat that had come out from Amnesty International about the care home sector, where they described it as if people were being treated as if they were expendable, uh, which is the exact opposite to what Mark had said about being dehumanised, really, um, throughout the process of the pandemic. But this has just given such a focus on the individuals and not only the awful, dreadful time that people have had over the 18 months, but the absolute resilience that people have shown through it. And so maybe society's tried to leave people behind and has attempted to, but actually the strength of people who were tried to left, be left behind has really shone through. And I think that's what 
has kind of come through in both of these projects today and and the kind of relationships and the importance of that and of us all kind of supporting each other and it, it feels really lovely to kind of have the two projects together actually so thanks for facilitating that Liz. I've, I've done very little it's all you guys really I'm, I've, just, I've just shown up today <laughs> um but yeah i think unless anyone else has got any questions that was a great question Oliver. thank you um i just wanted to probably round up then and basically wish you all the best the rest of your day a huge thank you for coming along and taking part and um, as a reminder a recording of this will go on our youtube channel it usually takes us about a week to get it transcribed transcribed and, and up on live and um, so we'll share that link with you as well um, and actually some good news for you all. Um, we will be showing it in our gallery, at least as a starting point, um, around this time next year. So we'll be having it in our main gallery shows um, from both projects, whatever the final outputs and outcomes are. But then there are, as always, ambitions to get that to be a bigger program of work, whether that's nationally or regionally, um, online. And again, thinking about what are the different ways we might sh show it beyond the gallery space. Um, you know where do we need to get it so hopefully between now and, and next year we can continue those conversations and think about where it's best placed um, for maximum impact really um, so yeah thank you all so very much um, and I will let you get on with the rest of your day and um, so take care everybody thank you for, for today thanks, thanks, very thanks much. Liz thanks, thanks everyone. everyone bye bye, bye. bye.